whatever that thing is, I want you to write it down on your card right now. Because I want to promise you one thing, and this is kind of bold for me to promise, that this is, I'm doing this with what I believe to be the Lord's authority, and this is what he asked me to do. So I'm going to tell you that God's going to speak to us about that specific thing today. Okay? So I want you to write it down so you'll know. If you don't write it down, you're not going to hear the answer. So um, take that thing. It could be something in your family. It could be something in your career. It could be whatever it is that you think, if that bus would move my life, I'd be able to walk into the fruition of what my life is supposed to be. If this one thing would move. And it could be something you've been praying for for a long time, and it could be something that you don't even pray for anymore because you just stop believing that it's ever going to happen. Okay, okay, you can write them all down. All right. I know I've got mine too. I didn't write mine down because mine have already, we here to dealt with me on this this morning. Okay, I want you to just hold on to that for a minute. When we think about the armor of God, we seldom think about prayer. We think about the idea of putting on the armor because we're going into battle. But, and, and I've heard it taught many times, the armor of God, but even they talk about each piece of the armor, but then they don't even mention the prayer. Like, like that the prayer not, not, um, doesn't have to do with the armor. Um, what I want to challenge you with today is the idea that the whole reason you're putting on the armor is for prayer. You put on that helmet of salvation and say, God, I am safe in who you are. You put on that belt of truth, the truth of God's word wrapped tightly around you. Your heart is protected with the uh, breastplate of righteousness. You've got the shield of faith being held up and saying, oh, Jesus, I can't even see the flames of the enemy coming at me because your shield is so thoroughly protecting me right now. And your arm is held high with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you were able to just... Um, fight through and cut away every lie about you because you're holding on so tightly to the word of God. Your feet are shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And right then, you are ready to enter into the real battle, which is prayer. Do you get it? You're built in the armor of God and you're going into battle that battle, it mentions prayer after you have the whole armor of God in, because until you have that armor of God on, you're really not ready to go into the wage war, which is prayer. Every single major revival that has happened began with one thing. And what is that? Prayer. It didn't come because there was some on-fire preacher, some amazing anointing, word of God, although those things are part of it. The, the battle came when people got down on their knees and humbled themselves before God and they had the full armor of God on. They were coming to God fully believing in who he said he was, fully aware, fully armored in the armor of God and ready to pray down heaven onto earth. That is the battle. That's the war right there. So you have to have your armor on before you're ready to wage war and go into that battle. So what is prayer? That's when you are in the armor of God and the spirit of God is able to come inside of you and is able to intercede things that you didn't even know that needed prayer. He's able to intercede. His spirit literally comes inside of you and you're able to speak things uh, according to his will. My kingdom come, my will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. What is that? It's something we say, but literally when we get down and we pray and we're armored up in God, we're able to speak what that is to, to our lives individually. My kingdom come. What does his kingdom look like in your life, in your family's life? What is his will for you and for your children and for your next generation and your great inheritance? That's legacy, your legacy that is way beyond you. He knows, you don't, but when you pray, you can speak those things into existence as though they are. It's not about you. It's all about him. But until we're, we are armed up in the armor of God, we have no idea what that means. And so many of us don't ever experience this because, first of all, we don't put on the armor of God. Second of all, we pray according to our perception of what prayer is instead of the reality of what prayer is. Do you remember in, we talked about Adam and Eve in the garden? Um, they were in the garden 
and they were in perfect communion with God. It says Adam would talk with God, and God would talk with Adam. And they had this perfect unity between them. That's what we were created for. You could, you could say, in fact, that that was prayer, that God was talking with Adam, and Adam was talking with God, and there was this relationship. There was this relationship that was constant and that was unbreakable between God and his child. That's what prayer is. That's what prayer is. It's a, it's a relationship that you were entitled to as a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that you were entitled to as his daughter of unbreakable bond of you talking to God and him talking to you. Why do we have to have the armor on in order to have that? Because... The enemy knows exactly, not only the enemy, but our flesh goes way, is totally against everything pertaining to God. So we have to have our beliefs in place. We have to have the atmosphere and our mind and our heart pre right so that we can allow the uh, holiness of God to enter in. Otherwise, we'll be so busy telling him how unrighteous, how unholy, how crazy it is that he would even talk to us that we won't even be able to hear him. And, and the things that he has to say for us are good. We don't want to miss out on that. When those things are in place, the veil of our own eyes is able to be lifted and we're able to behold the Lord in glory and we're able to hear him speak over us. This is my beloved and whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine God saying that to you? That's exactly what he wants to say to you. We have to have our, we have to have our heart prepared so we're able to hear it. Having everything else cleared away. Joshua 1, 2 through 6, and Joshua 3, 3 talks about this. And you may think, what is, this isn't talking about this, but this is what it's talking about. Everything in the Old Testament with the Israelites, they walked out the reality of the kingdom that we walk in spiritually. So it's the same kingdom, but ours is spiritual and theirs is literal. So I am Joshua 1, 2 through 6, it says... Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that I have commanded in the law of Moses. Okay, and then also um, verse 33. <laughs> Where it says, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. So as soon as you see the Ark, you shall set out and follow it. And this is talking about land. This is when Joshua was, Moses had died. And Joshua, um, in Hebrew, Yeshua, was going to take the people over into the promised land. And girls, we have been given that promised land, and God expects us to walk in it. What I'm talking about, the, remember last week we talked about how um, the greatest hindrance to people knowing Christ and seeing Christ today is there are too many Christians not walking in the garden? It's our inheritance to walk in the garden with God, to have that communion with God. That is what prayer is. We have been given the inheritance. We have been given the promised land. The promised land isn't a place where you're going to put your feet in physically, although it was for the Israelites. For us, it's a place where we put our spiritual feet in, in the, in the presence of God. It's a place in our hearts and our minds, a territory of us giving it over all of who we are in the flesh, all of who we are in the world, over to Jesus so that we can receive all that he is in the kingdom of God and allow ourselves to walk in perfect communion with God. And we're not it's not just something you do in the morning. It's something you may start off in the morning, giving him your first fruits, the first of your day, 
and you may walk it out the rest of your day. Even while I'm talking to, if I'm talking to Brittany, in my mind or my heart, still having a sacred conversation with God, even while I'm talking with her, guiding and directing our conversation, um, it's something that once you learn to walk in that, just like you learn to walk in your house, you don't think about moving in your house like, oh, I better, I'm going to the bathroom now. Let me think, how do I get there? Um, no, when you learn to live and move and breathe in your habitation, he will become your habitation. You won't have to think about it. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, there may be new areas. If you're moving into a new city, you have to learn um, how to get to the grocery store. You have to spend time traveling around, and you may feel a little, little disoriented at first because you, you're in a new area, and you've got to learn what it is to move in there. God's always going to be moving us to a new area, and so there's going to be times where you start to feel real comfortable. You're like, oh, I know how to get there. I know how to get there. And this relationship with God, and he's like, okay, now you know how to get there. We're going someplace new. And he's taking you to a new territory. And you're going to feel disoriented. And you're going to have to learn your way around there. And you're going to have to trust him a little bit more. But you were created for that relationship, that communion with God. And it's, it's prayer. It's a relationship. Prayer is not something you do. It's an atmosphere you enter into every day, every moment. And the armor of God is what allows us to enter into the atmosphere. Does that make sense? We, if, um, we must prepare ourselves to enter in. And if we don't put our feet on it and have some responsibility in it, then we will never know what it is to live in it. There's some responsibility on our part. Our responsibility on our part is to the armor of God, to put on the armor of God. To remember who you are in Christ every day. If we don't, we may have a God, but it will not be the God. Because we were created to worship. If we're not worshiping Elohim, we're going to worship some other little God, lesser God. And we're going to waste time. And we're going to give our life away for nothing. It will be a powerless one. One that the... The one, the one that the Israelites followed is they entered, they wandered in the wilderness. They didn't, they didn't make any, they didn't gain any ground because they were wandering, because they were fixed on their flesh, not on the living God. They were complaining and missing the whole wonder of who God was, the one who came to save them. There are only two ways you were going to live out your life here on earth. You're either going to be conquering or you're going to be wandering. And if you look at yourself right now, you get to determine which one you're doing. You're either conquering or you're wandering. Wandering, if you're going in the same place, you're staying in the same place, and you're not going anywhere with God, and you're complaining, saying, why, 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 why? Believe me, he's looking at you saying, why, 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 why? I gave you my son. I've given you the whole promised land. I've given you my whole kingdom. Go. Go forward. Move in it. I've made you a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror in Christ. Go forward. Go forward. One of those ways leads to life and the other to death. It takes a warrior to enter in, and that's exactly what we are. That's the whole essence of what this class means. Pink armor. Princess warriors for Christ. We are warriors. We're conquerors. We are more than overcomers. And I know each of you women. I know you are warriors. I know you. I haven't known you that well, but I've known, I mean, the, I can tell you these women are warriors. They really are. So, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. But, there are, I have seen many fall in the wilderness. This is kind of harsh, but I think if we're, if, I think it's okay to call them wilderness wimps. Because a lot of times, people die in the wilderness because they just won't get up and go forward. They have everything they need. They can give every excuse in the book. But they will not do the one thing that is required of them, which is to believe God and go forward. And if we do not believe God and go forward, we are going to die in the wilderness. Wilderness wimps. We're going to die in the wilderness as wilderness wimps. There are days for me and there are days for you where you're not going to want to do it. You're going to want to get up. And you're, going to, you're not going to want to get up, and you're not going to want to put on your armor, and you're just going to want to stay in bed and go, oh, do I have to do this? Oh, my gosh. This is so much work, just being a Christian. Why do I have to love you so much, Jesus? 
<laughs> I'll tell you, one of the greatest things for me, I think, honestly, that's why he made me a teacher, because he's like, okay, girlfriend, I can't even trust you with a leash. I've got to trust, I can only trust you with a ponytail holder. You cannot get far away from me at all, because you will totally jump off the deep end if you even go two centimeters away from me. And just knowing that I have to stand up here every Sunday and teach you ladies is enough for me to get up and say, okay, because some days... I'm not going to lie, some days I don't do it for me, some days I do it for you. But once I get up and do it, it doesn't matter what reason, it's for me once I get up and do it. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you need some accountability, get it. Do whatever you got to do to be strong in the Lord and to conquer the land that he's giving you. I'll never forget this one time when I was, this wasn't this past bout with sickness, but this was back in 2008 when my daughter Hope was only two. And I was really, really, really sick. And they sent me home from the hospital and I was still very, very sick, very, very weak. And with a two year old, okay? Um, <laughs> which they have a lot of energy. And, and I, it would have been one thing if I would have died because then I could have escaped that whole thing. But, um, but I had to live. And, and I, was, I was kind of a little upset because I was like, oh, my gosh. And at that point, I didn't know I was going to get better. All I knew was I was going home. They didn't know. They, they gave me no hope that I was going to get better. And they were just like, just learn to live like this. And I was like, what? And, I mean, I had no breath, no energy. And I remember laying on the floor in my bathroom, uh, laid out on the floor, and I was just having out. I was weeping. I mean, like crying hard. And I was just saying, God, please. Don't let me live like this. I can't be this kind of mom, this kind of mom that can't even take care of her kid. Um, please take me home. Please, Lord. Please either heal me right now. I'm not going to get up unless you heal me, God. I was just have one of those kind of days where I'm like, you either heal me or you kill me right now. You know? <laughs> have you ever had those moments with God where you're just like, you give him the ultimatum? And, um, and right then, it was hilarious. I was just really frustrated and just too, could, did not know how I was going to even get through the day taking care of that little girl. And she walked in the door and she, she the only time she had seen me get down like that is whenever I was giving her piggyback rides. So she gets on my back and she goes, giddy up mommy, giddy up. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm like laying here, like pouring my heart out and she gets on my back and tells me to give her a piggyback ride. And, but then at that moment, it was like God was saying, get up. If you, you tell me to heal you, you I'm, I'm, give, I'm telling you to get up right now. And you give your daughter a piggyback ride. And so I did. And it was, I've never forgotten that. Because there are moments in the, when you, how you least expect it in the most crazy ways, God will say, get up and go forward. You get up and go forward, girl. And I didn't have the strength, but I found the strength as I got up and gave her that piggyback ride. I found the strength to do it. And then each day, little by little, I got a little stronger until I was, until I was pretty normal. And my faith in God grew. But I never forgot that. And so many times since then, he's, when I've had those moments where I'm like, ah, he's like, giddy up, Rida. Giddy up. Get up and go forward, girl. Get up. See, you guys don't know this, but tomorrow he made me tell some of you, giddy up, <laughs> get up, <laughs> we're going to get up and go forward. And he will pick you up and he will carry you if he needs to, but he will not let you go backwards. If you only trust him, he will always take, take you forward. That's why the armor, um, this armor has it on here, but the armor that God mentions in the Bible, it doesn't mention anything covering the back. The only part that wraps wholly around you is the belt, which is the belt of truth. There is no turning back in Christ. Once you gain the ground, you don't go backwards. You go forward or you stay in place, but you will not go backwards. You will not retreat. We were not made to retreat. We were made to go forward. Oh, and I love this. It says, Joshua 3.3, 3, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. So sometimes, sometimes we're not going to know exactly where to go. But God is, he doesn't tell us to know exactly where to go. He says, when you see that ark set out, you follow it. 
and he made it very clear uh, in the Bible with the old in the Old Testament there was a cloud there was a cloud that um, it was a cloud of uh, a cloud by day and a cloud of fire by night and when they saw that thing moving they moved and when it stopped they stopped and so it made it very clear okay you want to know what God's way is look for that when you look for that you follow it if it stay in put you stay put and then they had the Ark of the Covenant. When that Ark moved, if you wanted to stay in the presence of God, you followed it. And if you wanted to, and if it's if it were staying in place, you stayed. And that means a wait. Some of us are in the wait right now. And we're like, when is this Ark going to move? <laughs> and we just, our challenge is to just to stay put. That is our victory in just staying in place. And so... What we are to do now is when we see the Ark of the Covenant of our God, we are to move forward. And you may say, well, what is the Ark of the Covenant? I don't know what it is for you, but I know if you get in his word and you put on the armor, you'll see it. There will be something come for you, a presence come for you, and he will show you what it is, what it means for each of you in your individual lives to go forward to the next step. And, in, and until he gives you that next step after that, you're going to stay put. For them, it was literal. For us, it's spiritual. And we've got to learn this or we're not going to go anywhere with Christ. We're never going to go anywhere with him. And we're going to say, I'm waiting. But what are you going to wait for? God is spirit. We must follow him in spirit and truth. You are no longer a physical being. You are a spiritual being. You better learn how to get on in the spirit or you're not going to go anywhere. Do you have something? Yeah, I think, I think when we're waiting, there's always something he wants us to learn. Mm -hmm. And we think we're ready for the next step. But why? Why would he give us the next step when we haven't even conquered what he wants us to learn to this step? And then, <coughs> so, you know, sometimes that's... And, and we, we don't, that, and sometimes you know, we may think, I'm not getting any, I'm not gaining any ground. Right. But sometimes in the weight is when you're gaining the most ground. Yeah. <coughs> you're, you're, you're defeating a whole army and you have no idea that you're in right. that ground and that weight right there. <coughs> and the weight is sometimes where we see God and we trust him the very, very most. And I think all of us, at least for me, it seems like there's been assigned at least one long wait. And I don't know if I'll ever see the thing answered. But I mean, but it's, but it's, it doesn't even matter anymore because it's the intimacy of growing with Christ as I wait this thing out. That is the ground I'm gaining. That is the victory I'm gaining. So sometimes we just get scared. And we wonder, if would it just be easier if we didn't even know God? And that you know what the coolest thing about Him is He will get. He doesn't matter if you feel that way. He's gonna get. He's gonna show up for you anyway. He's gonna say, "Giddy up, giddy up, girl. You can stay in your bed from now till next week, but I'm gonna be standing right here by you, saying, "Giddy up, get up. Let's go up and move forward. We can do it today, or we can do this next week, but we're going forward because I love you too much to leave you the same." We are going forward, whether you like it or not. You're mine now, and I'm the one that gets to determine what your life is, not you. And he will take us and carry us forward, even if he has to get us out of bed and pick us up himself and carry us on his shoulders. But if we thought the stepping stones of the giddy up, we would not grow. Exactly. Yes, we you're right. Need those we need it. And we need to trust him yeah. and know that even when we don't have it together, he has it together for if we just get up and we just need to put our face towards him, he will do what it takes to get us to the next step. You know, Sometimes that is our next step. Just get up and put your face towards Jesus. You know, I was going to say along with what she's saying, though, too, like you were saying, like she jumped on your back. Sometimes God has to do that to get us moving. Because I've always like, why are you doing that? You know, I was like, it's because you're not doing what I told you to do. And he's... He will, like you said, push it forward, even if he has to put something in your path right. to basically make you move. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> to put a lion in your path. Exactly. Or a two-year-old. <laughs> Same difference. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We think we have so many choices, but we really don't. We have one choice and one thing we have control over. What will we let Jesus do in our lives? Who will he become to us? Will we go forward with him or will we stay in who we are? And that is it. That's our choice. That is our choice. And our victory is to go forward with him. 
sometimes, sometimes we often get confused about how do we pray? How do we pray? What is prayer really? We just talked about the fact that it prayer is our communion with God. It's it's our it's our heritage. It's our right. It's our inheritance. Adam lost it at the fall, but Jesus gave it back to us at the cross. And we get to know Jesus, and we get to walk with him and talk with him and live in the very same, even better than what Adam had. Adam had God out here on the outside communicating with him. We have the wellspring of living water. We have God within us able to look at the very intricacies of who we are, not just what we tell him, but like he can see in our heart. We don't have to... We don't even have words to describe sometimes what we're experiencing. But he says, I know. I know, sweetie. I know exactly what you're going through. Yeah. I'm in your heart right now. I see it. The gift of the Spirit. Yeah. He gives us the Spirit. We have better. We, we've got it way better than Adam had it. That is what we have. And we've got to start using it and taking advantage of that beautiful relationship we've been given. In Matthew 21, 12 through 13. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold the pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it into a den of robbers. Did you know what he convicted me of not long ago? He said, Rhonda, I am angry with you because you are making this temple into a den of robbers. Rhonda, you are coming at me, and you want to buy, you want to have this relationship with me where we barter, where we buy and sell. Jesus, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, and I'm going to ask you to bless my whole day. And he's like, that is not going to work with me. And do you know that there aren't that many times we saw Jesus really get angry, but this is one of the times where he got angry. And he literally turned over the tables, and he said, this shall be a house of prayer. <coughs> do you know that's exactly what he's saying about each of you right now and me? He's saying that you are his temple. You are his temple. And he's saying, you are at my house of prayer. I will not give you over to be um, a place for a den of robbers. Where you come to me and you say, I'm going to give you a quiet time, Jesus, and I, you better do what I want you to do. You better make this happen for me today. And maybe we don't say that out loud, but in our hearts we expect it. We have this expectation. I did A, B, C, and D. Check, 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 check. Okay, I get the blessing of God today because I earned it. The whole thing about God is when we come to him in prayer, we come in humility. Never about trading. We have nothing to sell. We have nothing to offer. That's why it can never be about selling and a barter economy. It's about a receiving. I have nothing, Jesus. Nothing to offer you but my sin. And Lord, I'm opening myself up to you. And I want to tell you the truth about myself, God. This is something that's been going on in my heart today, and it is ugly. And I'm going to confess it to you. And Lord, I don't even know. I'm so lost in who I am. I don't even know for sure exactly where I'm sitting. And I'm just being flat out honest with you, God. I don't even know where it is. But Lord, you know me. You know my innermost places. Can you show me the truth about myself? Because I really know I need you today. And I'm going to allow you to look in the intricacies of who I am. And I want to look into the fullness of who you are. And I want to walk with you today. I want to walk <coughs> in the garden with you today. And I want to enter into the fullness of who you are, God. Jesus, I need you. And I'm not going to try and get up today and make it one day, one moment, one minute without you. So please have your way with me. Whatever it takes, Lord, show me the truth about myself. And show me the truth about who you are. And I know I'll be victorious because you will carry me through this day trusting you and this is just the beginning Lord I'm going to talk to you all day long and I'm going to bring everything to you it's in your name I pray Lord amen and that is what we offer him it's a receiving it's letting him tell us and sometimes we miss it because we pray and we give God our list and oh uh, Lord um, help so and so's mom today and um, help so and so's grandma today and uh, oh yeah and it's about us entering this mental list of people that need prayer and really it's good to pray for people and we should but I've gotten into the habit of asking God Lord how do you want me to pray for them how do you want me to pray for them because we don't know how to pray for them in and of ourselves and so we it's a time 
where he changes our sight. We walk in with one perception and we leave with a whole different perception because we're seen as God sees, not as we see. Our eyesight changes. My eyesight changes. I walk every day. I walk in in the morning. I get my Bible and I lay. I sit down and I have a perception of what I think my needs are. But you know what? By the time I get up with him, it's never the same. In fact, usually when I get up and walk away, I don't feel like I need anything. I'm full. I'm full. And my, nothing about my circumstances has changed. But my perception of all, everything about my perception of my circumstances has changed. Because I have been in the holy ground with the Lord. He has filled me up. And I'm entering that day full, full, overflowing. Like it says in Psalm 23, where he says, my, uh, my cup overfloweth. My cup overfloweth. How often do we hear David pray for an ingrown toenail? Think about David's prayers. He's our example of how to pray. How often do we hear him pray about for other people? Not he. I mean, sometimes we feel selfish if we pray for ourselves. Is that not right? And we're like, oh, before I forget, I gotta pray for them because no, 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 no. If you want to tag add them as a tag along, that's fine. But for you to come to God and say, before I pray for me, let me pray for this person. Do you get that's kind of that's kind of presumptuous because you need prayer. <laughs> you may not think you do, but you do. David taught us this expertly. He cried out to God all the time for himself, for himself. I mean, if he cried out, and I love it because he cried out for other people, and sometimes he cried out for God to uh, um, get them. Go get them. And it's okay to ask God that. He understands. He knows our frame. It's okay when, when, if we need to tattletale on someone. And I do it often. And sometimes I have to go into my bathroom and just say, Oh, I just have to tell you this because I don't want to blaspheme by telling someone else. But I'm telling you, this is what happened to me. And I'm angry about it. And I'm telling you, God. And I have to do that often. And that's okay. He loves you and your heart is safe with him. He is the only one you really can do that to without any repercussions. So it's okay to do that with the only thing we can offer to Jesus is our sin. We have nothing to offer him but our sin, and that's exactly what he came for. And so often, the enemy will tell us, you can't go pray. You can't go pray because you've done this and this and this and this and this. You better get that right first before you go pray. And there, there's nothing we can't, what are we going to do to get it right? Nothing. We can't go do ten good things to make up for the five bad things we did. All we can do is come to him and say, Jesus, I sinned, and I'm giving this to you, and I'm a sinner. But you came for sinners. Thank you, Lord. That is exactly what he came for. And he will, in exchange for our sin, in exchange for our ashes, he gives us a crown of beauty. Isaiah 61, a crown of beauty for all our sins. And we will walk out righteous, not because we did anything, but because we came to the perfect Lamb of God, and we received the blood with which he for our sins. We're never going to feel like praying, guys. We're never going to get up and be like, I shouldn't say never. Sometimes I wake up and I just can't wait to talk to him. And, but it's in that when, we're, we're gonna, when we get in those places where we've drifted, where we've been in a place of wandering, we're not going to automatically feel like turning around and going back to him. It's a, it's a, there's got to be a holy unction there. There's got to be God saying, it's time. And you, you need to obey and listen. When Christ came and you decided, I want you to really think about this. Pretend like for a second, go back to that girl you once were before you knew Jesus. And someone, it, just imagine someone coming up to you saying, there was this guy that lived 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross for you. And you better give him your life. He, want, he wants to take your life. And he will give you his life in exchange. Doesn't that sound like a great deal? And if, unless you were in that place, you'd be like, what? You need to be on some meds. Um, that sounds crazy. And to the world, that sounds crazy. Okay? It's, it's not natural to, to want that. Okay? The, the reason you know Jesus 
is because he himself came for you. And no one explained it to you. It was a supernatural encounter. It was a supernatural encounter that you would want to follow and give your whole life to someone who died on a cross for you 2,000 years ago. And it's a supernatural thing that you want to know him through his word. And do you know what? Prayer is a supernatural. It's supposed to be a supernatural encounter also. It's a supernatural relationship that you walk in every single moment of your day. That I could be talking with Brittany. And in my mind and in my heart, I'm having a conversation with God. And I'm even, my conversation with her is being affected by my conversation with God. That's supernatural. Everything about your life right now is supposed to be supernatural. Because you're a supernatural being. Living by the spirit, not by the flesh. And if you really, really think about that, that's crazy awesome. It's awesome. I feel like Wonder Woman right now just saying that. So, we have this great privilege that so many of us are not entering into because we're still focused on this and this. Instead of focusing on what we have through the living Holy Spirit of God, everything about our lives is supposed to be supernatural. Not in the weird sense, but in the sense that we're connected to the Spirit and we live out our lives through the Spirit. It should be a supernatural experience, not leaning on our own understanding, but acknowledging Him in all of our ways, make, letting Him make our path straight, not us or what we think we need to make our path straight. Okay. In closing, I want you to take your cards that we started out with, Because I said in the beginning that we were going to hear from God. And because there's one thing that we tend to do. Sometimes we, we talk to God. We're in the Word. We're having this, uh, we have our prayer time. But we never let God listen. We never listen to Him. There needs to be a time in prayer where we are quiet and we receive. And we just receive from Him. And that's what I want you all to experience right now. I want each of you to take your card. I want you to close your eyes and just talk to God about that thing on that card. And I'm going to be praying for you. And I want you to receive from him what he has to say to you. He's going to speak to each and every one of you at this moment. And then I'm going to pray and we're going to be dismissed. You can be dismissed when you hear from God. Just go ahead.